coming from a very poor home. My father was a tailor. Well, I have two brothers and two sisters, and we hardly made a living, but we had a very happy life because we had each other. And I had a lot of friends in school. I was a happy teenager. And I thought I am on the top of the world because I didn't need no, I didn't experience no better life. And I thought that is the best I can have. And I was happy with it. And you told me once that before the war you were a Polish patriot, that you loved Poland. I love very dearly, and I was very proud to march for different uh, occasions, holidays, and from the school with our flag. And I was very proud to be a citizen of Poland. Before the war you were a nurse. I wanted to be a nurse, but because my parents were very poor, and they, cannot, they couldn't afford to send me to a special school. So I worked during the daytime, and at night I went to Red Cross School. For two years I was going to school to be a nurse, and I needed five years of school. So then the war broke out, and I couldn't continue my education to be a nurse. Before the war broke out in the summer of 1939, um, you thought that Poland would be victorious. Well, they were talking about a year before, in 1938, we heard what is going on already in Austria, and we f had the feeling that eventually we will have a war with Germany. But everybody said, don't worry, we will have help from France and England, and we might win the war. And we were so proud of Poland that we didn't want to believe that we're going to lose it. And you didn't know it would be also a war against the Jews? No. No, this we didn't know before. We were just talking about the war. But the war against the Jews, there were two wars actually, yeah. One against the Jews and one on the regular front. The first uh, the 1st of uh, September, when I saw there were coming uh, uh, airplanes, and all of a sudden bombs from the airplane. We didn't see the airplanes and the bomb, but we saw the little house co completely upside down. The roof was on the on the ground, and when that was next next closer the next block. And my grandmother said, come on, children, to the cellar. We had a cellar in the house. We went down into the cellar, and we say, Shema Israel, I pray. And we stood there for a while until it quieted down. And we came back out, and she said, now we know the war is, is for true. They sought to dehumanize you and to create dissension and confusion among the Jewish ranks. They always had a satisfaction to see us dehumanized, to see us that we fighting over a piece of bread, that we taken away the last crumb of bread from our children. Or even in the camp, when they gave us, they were supposed to give us a slice of bread, they didn't give us the slice of bread. They gave us a whole little loaf from a pound, and we were supposed to divide it for 10. And very seldom you could measure with a centimeter or with an inch that every slice was just the same. And then the fight began too, because one sometimes got a crumb more, and the other one had less, and, and they were staying and laughing, they had very, there was had a, a lot of satisfaction in to see us fighting over that crumb of bread.
nurse in a factory within, inside the Loge ghetto. I wonder if you would describe the Loge ghetto. The Loge ghetto was, in the very beginning, we, we were trying to survive. And we were hoping that it will come eventually to an end. So, but the starvation was big, and the disease was big, and it was very hard to survive in the Lodge ghetto. I have my sister died with tuberculosis in the Lodge ghetto, and they took off my father and the brother off the street in the Lodge ghetto and never returned back, and they never told him where they're taking him, for what purposes. And it, the ghetto was isolated with barbed wires around, and we were sitting and waiting. The furniture, we didn't have any furniture because they were assigned to one little room in the ghetto. So at night we rolled our bedding, whatever we could bring from home, and at the daytime we rolled it up and we sat on it. And we waiting because every 10 days we were getting a ration of a piece of bread and some marmalade, some barley. This was just enough to eat for one person and not to have enough, not just to divide it for 10 days. But we were trying hard, hard and to survive on it. And then the, the Germans built factories in the ghetto. I was working in the hospital, so sometimes we kept a dead body a little longer in order to receive a, a slice of bread for this dead person because it was counted. That's so many slices of bread per, per person. And we count the dead body sometime, so we had a couple slices of bread more. How did you keep going when everything seemed so... It was very difficult, but I had a friend, and she came to stay with me before I went to the ghetto. Her name was Bronya, and her maiden name was the same with my name, and we got very close. Of course, she was older. She came from Austria. They killed her husband in 1938, and she was born in Poland, so she has to come back to Poland, but she had two daughters, 12 and 10 years old, and that was a free immigration to London for Jewish children at the time in 1938, and she sent those two girls to nobody but to London, and she, I was very close with her, and she has a very strong willpower to live her determination to survive was so great that it had a lot of influence on me because she had, a, she wants to see her children and she said she has to see her children and she will see her children. And we, and she had a lot of influence. And that's probably that courage, her courage gave me a little bit too. And it was very hard. And because I came really from a very poor home, and not starvation, but we didn't have any luxury, so I gradually got used to this kind of life in the ghetto too. The coldness, and uh, it was very cold in winter time, and with the food, and we tried to survive. People committed suicide in the ghetto. And, uh, the intelligent people, they commit suicide because they, uh, they knew exactly the outcome from it, what will be. The poor people, they was just striving a day at a time. Every day they pushed to survive. But the intelligent people like doctors or the pharmacists, they commit suicide because they know that's no, no 
that will be a tragic ending anyway. So they do it better this way than to go to camp and be killed up there. In the ghetto, you never heard of the death camps that were furiously at work? No, no. We just knew that they sending people away for work. It was a big lie. I was in the Ravensbrück two months, and every day I have to go to work. One day I was very sick, and my friend, and I didn't want to leave the barracks because it's, I didn't feel good, I had fever, and I didn't care. So she broke the a window and she pulled me out. She said, you know what will happen to you if you will not? Because they had the ovens, the big chimneys, and the smell we could smell every day in the Ravensbrück. So she pulled me out and she put me, she, I sat on a brick in between, the, because we have to stood in the morning two hours to be counted. So I was sitting on the bricks and it looks like I was standing up because I couldn't stay. And I went to work and for some, I got better. And for after two months, we went to the labor camp. She saved you? She saved me many times. She saved my life. I would be, the devil pulled me out from there because in the morning we have to leave the barracks and they locked the doors. And uh, many times I gave up because I, I know my, I left my mother in the ghetto sick on the floor and she was holding on to me and the Germans pulled me away from her. And my little brother, what, I was still with him to the last day. They took him away and they put him in a, they formed two lines in a courtyard. And they put my little brother in the line with the old sick people, so I know he will not survive this either. And uh, over, I, I knew my family was going, so I gave up and I really didn't care if I live or die. But she, she pushed me to it and she was the, so much, had so much influence on me. Ravensbrück was a woman's concentration right, camp, and right. it was very cold. Very. We, the, we were there. They gave us only some light clothes to wear, and a little blanket at night, a straw, a mattress from straw, a sack with straw, and a little sack with hay, and that was all. But we wrapped ourselves with paper in Wittenberg. When we worked, we could have more paper to wrap ourselves. So we were not so cold, but in, uh, in Ravensbrück was terrible. Wittenberg was the second concentration camp, and it was there, you were there when the Russians arrived and yeah. liberated the camp. That's right. This was, this was a labor camp up there. I worked there in a factory, and uh, we assembled we built parts to an airplane, and after we we finished with the part, they assembled a whole airplane from this factory. And we, the same way, they gave us just a uniform to wear from blue jean material, nothing underneath, no socks, not even underwear. So it was very cold but we wrapped ourselves in the paper. This uniform I was wearing nine months until the end of the war. I never took it off my, my body. I slept in it, I ate in it, whatever it was to eat. And I worked in it, I walked in the morning, the counters, everything in that uniform. Were you allowed to bathe? We didn't have one in the water. We had outside a washroom but the winter was so hot and the pipes were frozen so we couldn't even get water to wash ourselves. So the coffee or the tea, what they were giving us in the morning at night, this was our wash water. We washed in this, 
this water. We didn't wash more than our hands and face. And for the whole time we went to camp, we didn't wash. And then that day, the Russians are approaching. The Germans depart. You wake up that morning. There are no That's whistles, a, no dogs. No, no, nothing. It's quiet, very quiet. The night before, we received more bread than usually. And it was very suspicious to us. But nobody ate the bread. We were afraid it might be poison in it. But in the morning when, and we didn't sleep all night either, but when it got light, the daylight came, and we noticed the, the gates are open from the camp. And we didn't know what happened. So we ran out, and the first thing of on our mind was to get something, to find something to eat, or potatoes. We went and we filled out a bucket full of potatoes. And when we came back to boil the potatoes, the fire was on, we couldn't go back into the barracks. So we went down into the bunkers because the Germans put dynamite around all the barracks before they left. And the ones that survived all the harassments, all the atrocities, they died in the fire. And we waited until it was quiet and the Russian came in and they told us that we cannot stay there because this is the front, they're still fighting the war on one side of the Elba, on the other side the Germans was there. So we went into a house, to a German house. We got clothes and we got downstairs and went to the cellar and we filled up another bucket of potatoes. And we, I came upstairs with another friend and we boiled the potatoes. She was a Russian girl. Yes, she was a Russian prisoner. And, but we were very close. And as we boiled the potatoes, a shot came through the window and she fell immediately dead. And with no any, without any excitement, with no feelings, I stood, she was laying in the front of me dead, and I stood to finish the boiling the potatoes. We couldn't wait to be ready. We were hungry. And I'm just thinking what became out of me at the time that I was so cold so without any feeling. And we left her behind and we took the potatoes and we couldn't stay in this house either because the Germans, the Russians told us to go home. We didn't know where home was, but we found it out and we have to go home. So it took us a whole month until we got back to Poland. And then you went to Lodge, your hometown. And then I was a whole year back in Lodge, I thought maybe somebody from my family come, service, or, or they, they will hear from me, I will hear from them, but nobody came. And I went to the house where I li we lived before, and I noticed that they have everything still ours. A Polish the, family living in your apartment? The family, and a Polish family. And they have our beddings, what we then took with us our green velvet bed spreads on the bed. And she said, she was so surprised to see me that I, maybe I should apologize to her that I'm still alive. And she's, I said, I didn't came for nothing here. I just came in the case if you have some papers or photographs, I would like to have them. But she said, no, we burned everything and we don't have, and the Jews not welcome any longer here in Poland. Max Fuchsman, he was different for me because he had a lot of energy and he survived with his brother. Well, 
I came to New York, really, and I was glad to be in New York because I didn't know English at all. And I came down, and there was nobody there to deny that I am not the person who I claim to be because I, I didn't have nobody. And I said, I will stay here in New York, but the wealth, the Jewish Welfare Federation was responsible, and I have to come back to New Orleans. And I was working for the old lady in New Orleans. And a young man came to stay. A lady across the street rented out rooms. And a young man came to pick up his luggage from the custom house. And the lady said, came to me from across the street. She said, you know, a young man is staying in my house and he's from Lodge. Your hometown. Yes, maybe you know him, but I didn't know him. And he was going to school not far away from my school, but I didn't know him in Poland, in Lodge. He just had to come down to New Orleans to me, and we, we wrote to each other. He was, he was in Atl- living in Atlanta, and he was not willing to come back to live here in New Orleans, but I said, um, this is my place where I, I was assigned to, to be. And he came down and we married, and we were very happily married. We have three daughters, wonderful three son-in-laws, but he's deceased already 18 years. We really didn't marry for love in the beginning because we just have the same need for each other, the same we come and we have so much in common. That's, we thought it will work out eventually, but it worked out very well. We were very happy, Mary. I hope I can be sometime useful to the other people. That's, that they will understand that's, because we're dying out, really. The Holocaust survivors dying out, and who will be there to stand up and deny those denials for the coming up today with all the books and are written by intelligent people? So really, the, it's what is me, especially, that there will be somebody who will stand up and say the Holocaust did exist. So the message that you want young people to fight because it's up to them that they can prevent from happening again because history repeats itself and it can happen again if we let it happen. And it's, it's very difficult. I'm still thinking of there is not a day and night not to dream of my people. It's just something that you cannot forget. And if they will be alive, they will be share. If my husband will share happiness too, because he didn't live long to see his grandchildren, only one. So it's that's life goes on, and you make the best out of it. And I hope my children will have a better life.